We have Flavio Dallanora here from our marketing team. So Flavio and I are going to present together. together. We also have Andrea Battistelli. We've got him on Zoom. He's our technical manager and Pina, our translator here. So there are a few slides that when we come on to the second part of the presentation, look, we're actually, Pina will present and we're just going to do a bit of translating on that. Then what we will do is a to finish the presentation, we will actually move in and introduce our wonderful panel, and then we will roll through in terms of our discussion. Each of the panel are going to actually just cover different areas, but there's a whole thread through in terms of sustainability. And within the presentation we're doing, we're going to pick up points that are going to be covered by some of the members of the guests, the guests we have today, the panel we have. So, by the way, folks, please ask questions, please have energy. Don't just think you've come here to relax, okay? You know, you get these powers of people just going, hey, I'm sitting down relaxing. So we do want discussion. We're gonna have a discussion amongst ourselves, but we want you to come in as well. What you have right now is you've got a glass of our consortia label Prosecco Dot White. You're also going to enjoy a glass of the consortia label Prosecco Dot Rosé as well. And I hope you've had a chance to go to the tasting tables outside. Have you been to our tasting tables outside? Great, thank you very much. If you haven't, please do go there. We've got six. Producers there, three of our producers have actually flown over, so that is great. Um, we are going to do lots of photos. I know I say this every time, but, but do look happy. <laughs> you know, because some people just don't look very happy in some of these pictures, and they're usually right in the centre of the picture. Uh, so you send a report in, and it's like that Smith song, Heaven knows, what's it? Heaven knows I'm miserable now. Yeah. So. Uh, Right, so what we'll do is we'll kick off the presentation, we're going to keep it snappy and pacey, but it's really important, and actually for those of you who came, who came here last year? So, yes. To show you what we were doing and how we're developing, and for those of you coming for the first time to our Prosecco broadcast about the sustainability so you can see what is actually taking place with Prosecco. Okay, so Flavio is actually going to do the first part of the presentation, so 
we'll boom it out here and then we'll get Andrea on as well. And as I said, yeah, please, please ask questions and the panel will certainly want questions throughout as well. Just one final piece, social media. You've got the hashtags in front of you on the, on the cards here as well. So make sure you're, you're doing lots of social media as well. We really appreciate that as well. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay, Hello, everybody. Thank you to be here. So, um, as Nia said, my colleague from the technical office uh, hasn't been able to be here, so I will uh, join in <laughs> for this uh, short presentation. Because to understand the, the project, the approach, and the goals that uh, the consortium has towards, has towards sustainability, it's important to, to know the context we are, we are in. So, uh, what is what is Prosecco do you see first? Prosecco do you see is a territory. We are in the northeast of Italy, and we uh, <coughs> cover two regions, Sicily, Venezia, Giulia, and uh, Veneto. From the province of Trieste, with the town of Prosecco, that gives the name to the entire denomination of origin, to um, five of the five provinces of Veneto, with the Treviso, that is the core province for the production territory. Uh, the territory is very, very wide. There are a lot of microclimates and soils composition, because we go from the Dolomite Mountains to the Venice Lagoon. So it's really uh, different from part to part. Uh, in fact, the um, vineyards are located at around 18 meters above <coughs> sea level. But we find uh, level vineyards in the Duma province, that is in the mountains, at about 600 meters above sea level. And uh, um, approximately 7% of the Prosecco um, Dock surface uh, <coughs> is composed by the slope in the um, Padua province, uh, Licenza province, and in the border between uh, uh, Treviso and uh, Bordenone provinces. Prosecco DUC is made with the, mainly the green <coughs> grape for a minimum of 85%. Uh, it is a native variety from uh, our area, and can be combined with a maximum of 15% of local grape varieties uh, like uh, Gerela, Veniso, Giana, <coughs> that all gives different characteristics to the, to the wine. Uh, Verdera gives more freshness and acidity. Uh, Gerela, as the noun sounds, gives more clear notes, uh, while Vendetta gives more uh, body to the, to the wine. Um, also, the international varieties can be combined with the Sinclera, with the Chardonnay, and the Pinot. In case of the Prosecco, you see Rosé. You will be born uh, from 20 years. Um, a maximum of 15%, so 10 15% of Pinot Noir vinified in uh, red without uh, with skin contact uh, can, can do the, the, the rose blend to make the, the Prosecco do see rose. Some numbers that you also find in our data brochure that you have uh, in front of you. Uh, there are a lot of grape growers more than 11,000. So um, there are all the farmers um, working in the vineyards and collecting the grapes. 1,148 wine producers, the people who transform the, the grapes into base wine, so the still wine. And finally, uh, 355 sparkling wine houses, the one who transform the um, base wine into sparkling wine, so the last phase and the bottling. Some uh, notions of the production method are after harvest, that is happening in September mainly, and the grapes are destemmed and then pressed. Then the primary fermentation happens, transforming mask to base wine, and then the second one, it happens in this um, autocut, so under pressure control uh, um, vessel, for the secondary fer fermentation. So when the bubbles are born. It has, uh, for the uh, white Prosecco do you see, uh, the minimum days are 30, while for the rosé uh, it's the double, so 60 days to stabilize the color and to refine the bubbles. After that there is the bottling phase and the labeling. One essential thing about the Prosecco do you see is that every bottle is, uh, is controlled through this uh, government state label also says Prosecco in, in it. <coughs> so um, if, you, if you see a bottle of Prosecco without it, 
doubt it, <laughs> it's not Prosecco. Because uh, Valor Italia is a third body that <coughs> controls, uh, does the clinical analysis and then the tasting of the, of the wines. So the, the ones who can bear the name Prosecco are given with the, the government label. The ones who doesn't pass the exam, let's say, they cannot have Prosecco on the, on the label and uh, they cannot have the, the government. Uh, this, this is our growth, three years. Uh, Prosecco Giusti is very young, it was born in 2009. It has a, had a huge growth during years. Um, we had our first uh, decrease last year, from uh, 638 million bottles to 616. Uh, but our turnover uh, growth, uh, grew sorry, to 3.5 billion euro. So more than the previous year with more bottles. So we are still happy with this uh, with this data. We want to uh, increase the, the value of Prosecco UC, and this is the right path. So these are all the different typologies, and an important data is the organic uh, production that counts for 6.5% of the total. So it's around uh, 30, 40 million bottles. So kind of a lot. Mm, about the export, the uh, domestic market market counts for the 20%, while the foreign market for the 80. So eight bottles on 10 are goes abroad for the second UC. UK is the top market uh, with 110 million bottles. USA is just behind with uh, 1 million bottle less. Then there is Germany, it's another historical important market. And first place, we have France that has uh, increased uh, in the last few years with double digit um, increased growth. So without doing any, any activities there. So we are very, very happy with it. And also Belgium is an important market. market. So, thank you very much, Flavia. So, there you go. UK, biggest, biggest market in the world. The second talk. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, now, what we're going to do is move on to the second part of the presentation. Uh, and one thing I just wanted to say, and I should have said in the intro, that Luca Guardi, who is our heads up the whole international team, is travelling around in, in, in some many countries, not even mentioned on, on, on the presentation there. So, Luca's just been out to Mexico, for example. Just been out there. So there's a. We are doing a lot of work in Asia, Australia. <coughs> it's a very, very busy time for the team, and there are lots of countries where we are still developing sales and, and activities as well. But let's move. Let's move on to the second part here. Is uh, Andre from us? Yeah. Yeah. Peter, right. Let's. So what we're going to do is Peter's going to present this this first sort of introductory slide for the second part of the presentation, very much about what we're doing on sustainability now. Okay. Thank you, Liam. Um, yeah, we have. Um, uh, Andrea Battistella from Italy, and she's going to talk about the role of the consortio uh, per la tutela della denominazione del prosecco. So, if you want to step. He says hello to everyone, and, says, <laughs> <laughs> and he feels so sorry that he uh, cannot be here today. It's actually a beautiful day, è una bellissima giornata, quindi. <laughs> it's our first one, okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay, do we move on to the next? I think we'll move on to the... I was just going to say, just in terms of Luca... Aspetta, aspetta, solo un attimo. Yes, sorry. I don't know. Does Andrea want to do any more on that first slide, or do you just want to keep rolling? He wants to spend a few words on this. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah that's good. Yeah. Okay. Okay, brevemente. So sustainability is uh, something like at the heart uh, uh, of Andrea and the uh, uh, consortium. So it's really sorry that you cannot be here, but if you want to spend a few words, if it's okay, just, yeah. Super. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So it's um, the consortium is, is very busy and they try to coordinate the activity of the producers. At the moment, that they are over the, uh, twelve thousand. Um, and uh, through activity like this one to promote uh, events, uh, fair master classes, and um, yeah, and obviously to protect the, the name and uh, to make sure that the le uh, legal requirements are observed. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What we're going to do, we're going to do, we're going to do some of these, I'll do this slides quickly. There are just the reason with Andrea, we've got two or three really projects we're doing with Andrea's. It's all his work, so he needs to talk that through. But they're really important in terms of the sustainability side. I think some of you are surprised actually what we're doing behind the scenes. Look, clearly we, when we heard last year, Silver was presenting. Look, we've got to talk about all these three elements, and I'm going to read out stuff. Folks, you can read that. But what, as we go through this presentation, we'll see in terms of society, economy, and environment. We're going to see examples, and obviously, in all three of those, of what we're doing, and then we'll see the summary of that what we want to continue to do as well. So we're really stepping up. And actually I should say as well with Andrea, he has all this liaison with all the wineries. So in terms of, we'll see some of the other elements we go through, which emphasizes his relationship that he has with all those producers and that important piece of communication because we are doing more on that. Okay. So we also can say that the approach of the consortium is based on these three pillars, yeah. uh, society, economy, and environment. Yes, and, and, I, and it's very much, you know, we've started a whole batch of new communication with them, haven't we? So, okay, let's let do this roll on there. So, and I think the, I think Andrea's going to come in again here now. Yeah, so Andrea, per si vuol dire velocemente per il progetto lanciato dalla Siga Consorzio di Tutela. So the projects are uh, numerous, and uh, so, yeah, so he wants to talk. Uh, more about, uh, yeah, and it, it goes for, uh, hand in hand with the consortium to, to understand the needs and uh, to find a practical uh, solution. Yes, you want to add that? Yes, so uh, there is like a big, uh, a big study from the consortium trying to put all the projects to, together to give uh, help and um, yeah, support to all the initiatives. Yeah. Better. Just one thing to add. One thing quite raised last year, which we are going to talk about, is just if you're a small producer. How does that work for you in terms of sustainability, making things happen from a monetary point of view? We're going to touch on that and have a discussion as well. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah, so there is this uh, uh, strong emphasis on the environment and, um, and every, so for every produ um, to, to calculate and to, to, to focus on the carbon footprint, on the water footprint on the, the environmental um, issue, so the focus is pretty much uh, there, yes. And then we have, uh, ora ci abbiamo l'altra slide, yeah. Do a bit of time on this, not. because this is, this is an important project we've been doing, and I think it's something that uh, many people may not, may not be aware of, it's obviously an issue where we've looked at Blair and how Blair is performing, in terms of weather and in terms of soil types. Um, so that's a, that's a project that's Yeah, so there is this focus on understanding like the uh, different uh, region uh, of the, yeah, of uh, the <coughs> land to, to see, yeah, this one are the, yeah, the quality of the grapes and um, uh, to, 
started to feel it. Yes. Um, yeah, so the, the, the focus is always to, to understand the sensorial um, uh, nodes and to, to be able, sorry, to, uh, and you see my back there? Yeah, so each characteristic would be like uh, really identified uh, through the different colors of the spectrum of the single area. Okay, because we broke, broke down some areas which are obviously wetter than others. So again, about about how much of the irrigation, we don't need any irrigation at all. That was something which was coming out of it. And then around those areas, about that. Um, Andrea, what did you say to the lavori che sono, si stanno facendo attualmente per, eh, in questo, su questo tema? Sì. So there are nine areas. Yeah. So obviously we're doing a lot of, one of the things about communication as well is actually just in terms of bees, about we've looked at the pollen counts, we're working again for communication about farmers, what they're doing, and in terms of the probably bees and how their you know, performance is better, we're working more closely on that as well. So these are small pieces you might say, but that's, you know, it's very important, all these different elements. And I think one of the other things which we, which is Andrea's leading is just making sure we're getting all that that communication out to the winemakers as well. I'm going to touch on a brief point briefly in relation to that as well. But again, it's this is a, you know, an important point project for us and developing all the time. Keep rolling. I'm, not, I'm going to just breeze through that because not because it's not important, but we're going to talk about, you know, we've talk, already talked a bit about water as a project. And let's remember as well, 2022 for us, it's dry, Warm temperatures, 2023, <coughs> wet, hail, it's challenging. So we all know how di you know, difficult things can be and the contrast of time. We still had good, good wines out of that, but again, it's, it, there's those, those challenges there as well. And like um, one of the other things is, and we're gonna touch on that a little bit during the presentation about the reduction of chemical use, obviously, uh, which we've worked on strongly now for a number of years. We do actually have something which I'm going to come on to in a little bit here, just in terms of, we have an anonymous piece that people can say, and they can come to the consortium and say, you know, in terms of it could be about social, it could be about employment, situation, they can say something anonymously, but also if they feel there's anybody out there we're using chemicals irrationally, they can report that anonymously as well now to the consortium. So they can do all of that because we've got to be, you know, there's a lot of people out there, we've got to be monitoring everything. Okay, let's just uh, go on again. And then again, just in terms of, some of you know all about this, but you know, we've got a couple of varieties we're going to talk about a bit later, which we're bringing back in, but again about disease resistance varieties. Obviously, we've got to look and see what we can do. Productivity, there are more challenges out there. We know that the contrast between that 22 and 23 is limited to this one. Neil, just a quick question. Yeah. When you talk about irrational use of chemicals, mm. how would you define that? Oh, no, that's probably sounding a bit severe, but I think it's just... A, Meaning more than permitted? Yeah, I think you just saw somebody, somebody was living next to a farm and they felt they were actually using... More than might be legally yeah, yeah. permitted. And then they, have, they can then, if they want to, anonymously report that in. And someone would go and yeah, yeah, we're, we're yeah. I was curious. Yeah, Thanks. so we're, we're, it's a way of man. I think one of the key things here is about the communication stuff, <coughs> because we're just trying to do more of that at all sorts of levels. And by opening up, almost if you might say, you can actually shout out if you think something isn't right. You can do that anonymously. It's good. Now, 
one of the things is, given by the, the climate situation, okay, so what we have done is we, Flavia talked about Bediso Pereira. So, indigenous grape varieties. The vineyards that we've had for Bediso and Pereira have come down, but they, Pereira gives you that, as Barry said, gives you fruit, pear character, the grapefruit like pears, and it just gives you a really nice aroma as well. But also with Bediso, it gives you acidity. But we are looking, what we're going to do is actually plant more of Pereira and Bediso again. And we are looking at some other grape varieties that aren't even planted as yet, like Boscara, which some of you know is grown and used. And we are looking at those because of the long-term piece of actually, do we need to have more of a range of varieties in the future? I mean, Glera is very heat resistant, it's very adaptable, but we are looking at those. So we are looking at a number of different grape varieties that are being planted now. We're concentrating on Treviso, but also we're looking at Baluna, which is up in the hills there, it's cooler, you get more acidity. So we're looking at those as well. So that project has actually started, so that we're looking into the future to see what's going to actually happen there. Would we look at some varieties and actually bring it back historically where some producers would have used Pediso, for example. Rogerio here today, they've actually got plantings of Pediso and Pereira, for example. Okay, so there's that piece. Okay. So it's actually these photographs that were taken in the Luna Valley. You see the mountains are very close. Yeah. Okay, that's an example. This is a great place to go, everybody. <laughs> uh, just have to say that. Right. Okay, and obviously, like lots of other people, we are, in terms of pruning, how we, we're reusing everything, as many producers are, but we're much more active on that now. And again, that's all part of the program. And, yep. And obviously, yes, I talked about this just notification system. <coughs> so you can, if you want to whistleblow, you can do that confidentially confidentially and you can actually send that in and so that can be dealt with in different ways okay and that's yeah one of the things we had last year is what we're doing about people what's happening in the Prosecco land about people in terms of community that came up okay and again just talking about people unemployed desperate time not a great time again getting them involved in training as well could be about pruning could be just getting involved more in the harvesting you know, a lot of things have developed over the years, but we need to get sort of get more people involved. And we've got so to, to keep the local community. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. Big cities. Yeah, so so yeah, so yeah. yes, like like here, you know, <laughs> lots of people, people just can't get people. Leave out of the Yes, completely right. So, I mean, just move on there, and then that part of the training course element as well. So yeah, like pruning mm -hmm. for uh, farmers. Yeah. And the other thing we did present at Ben Italy this year, obviously Ben Italy was where we are last week, two weeks ago. Uh, we just talked about responsibility as well, responsible drinking, you know, just saying moderation, you know, we we enjoy ourselves, but just saying to everybody, you know, we've got a great style of wine here, it's very popular, it's wonderful, but also just putting a responsible message with that as well. So we presented that for the first time at Ben Italy this year. Yeah, Italy and the consortium has become Italy's coordinator for wine innovation program. So it's our big responsibility yeah. and a big role we are uh, assuming. So we start we start for all that. So yeah, that's great. Just for, for one month. Okay. So now we have to come back and we're gonna have to be I think so let's be pretty, pretty quick because I'm very conscious mm -hmm. of everybody's we're leading about five. Yeah. Okay, so um I mean siamo qui all'ultima la trentesima. Eh, per, i, eh, per i progetti lanciati dal Consorzio Vitticella. Mm. Yes, so this is the last the economical uh, bit and is um, uh, to make sure that the demand and offer are always going uh, hand in hand. Yeah. Last, last, last. Yes, so they're analyzing um, always like every visitor to make sure that all the parameters are correct. Yes. Through the collection of this data, according to the Osservatorio Economico, a system that collects every data to get uh, numbers on sales and to keep the balance between demand and offer. Yeah, so. Um, just obviously production process, you've all been to wineries at times, you thought, I'm actually seeing something happening here which doesn't look the most efficient thing, there's nothing over there, 
those who are just nodding anyway. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but actually, seriously, like if you're seeing a bottling line and you're actually thinking, hold on a minute, this would be much more efficient. There's wastage here, all of those things. So it's monitoring all that and actually just making everything just more efficient. But also, Andrea is heavily involved in that whole supply demand piece as well. So he, he actually manages all that too. So he's got a big job. And that's so thank you for your patience. I know it was a bit longer than we wanted to be there, but we wanted to get Andrea on because he's driving a lot of this, and I think it's very important terms of communication. We are doing more things, I think, than we think. You know, that's the thing. It's like the Gera project, what are we looking at? Great varieties. And I think also something we didn't get across last year so much is actually what's happening on the community side as well. And clearly you've got to be smart on that on the economics. Okay. I'm going to ask our wonderful panel to take a seat now, and then we'll do a few <laughs> intros, and they're going to they're going to roll, folks. And what we're going to do as well is we're going to bring out the. Do you want some prosecco rosé now? Yes. Yes. Yes, <laughs> right. yes please. Oh, we all do. Really. Yeah, we all do. <laughs> so, yeah, that. Some of those pieces we're talking about, I want to have here, we're going to talk about. We are in a discussion. Andrea's staying with us, so if questions come up at the end around some of those projects, we'll pick those up and Peter comes and translate that. We have the rosé coming around. I was just really excited to the rosé. We might have some. We might have some. Yeah, yeah, good photo. By the way, please, we will do some lovely photos at the end as well, and enduring, and please ask questions. Right, let me do some introductions. Uh, Peter Stanbury, Director of the Sustainable Wine Roundtable. Peter was with us here last year. We thought he was so thrilled. We'd have him back once again. But actually, there's only one, one direction. <laughs> there's only one direction. That's a bad He's a political economist. Uh, he's got three decades of experience, a consultant, three decades of experience. But he's also um, currently directed on research, very importantly, on the Sustainable Wine Roundtable. And if any of you haven't connected to the Sustainable Wine Roundtable, you need to, because there's quite a heck of a load of content. Uh, and Peter's going to talk in a minute about what actually he's been covering over the last year. But there's a load of stuff, and you need to get involved with that. You're doing some brilliant work, there, and you're learning all the time. We also have the wonderful Shane Holland, who was also here last year as well, an executive chair at the Slow Food in the UK. And Shane has had a lot of experience over the years, headed up lots of businesses, does a lot of work, and also has great insights. And I think you just get through all the money mess, don't you? Just get to that point. Yeah, that's what Shane does. So expect sharp stuff, everybody. Um, and I'm delighted to say we have Ellen Manning here. And Ellen and I have done a lot of presenting together. And actually, Ellen and I first met on a Prosecco dot trip. Okay? We were out in the vineyards there in Treviso. And Ellen enjoyed it so much. Uh, by the way, that's, we haven't got a competition. <laughs> we haven't got a competition like that, but we'd like to do that. But Ellen managed to, so a lot of work, the reason for Ellen here is, is what I think, what is Ellen's perspective is lots of consumer writing, writing the mail, done lots of television stuff, lots of food work as well, featured in The Guardian. But actually, it was really interesting because we did an Instagram live together a few months ago, and I said, look, I think it'd be really great if you came on the panel. So you can see just getting different sectors here as well. And then I'm just delighted to say we have Hal Wilson here, Bringing in the independent sector as well. So we wanted to do that again, like last year we had a good cross-section. We wanted to do this. So I was Hal from Cambridge Wine Merchants. How many shops you got now? Three in our own, but we supply some ten shops. You, you took, 
Three to seven. Three to seven. Three to seven, folks. I go on seven, okay? <laughs> so, but it's really great because it's an important sector. It's an important sector for Prosecco Dock, actually, in terms of development, actually, there. And Luma Montero. Now, Luma's got two jobs. Okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, see. Luma. Pardon? Luma. Probably more. <laughs> this is a, in this case, I can't go three to seven, it's two. But the thing is, Luma Montero, Luma works actually for Davies of London. And it's interesting because we have the ombre prosecco out on the tasting tables there, and David's listed on, on ombre prosecco online, but also in your bars as well. So we're going to get that entree perspective as well, and a bit more independent perspective. But also as winery official on Instagram, so we're also going to get the in Instagram perspective in terms of approach to sustainability. So, ladies and gentlemen, give a big round of applause for our wonderful panel. <laughs> Peter's going to kick off. He's asked questions. He, actually, I should explain, each person is going to do a little piece, but it's going to weave in. It's about a discussion, this. And it's also about you asking questions, too. Thank you. Um, Neil's asked me to kick off because uh, at SWR, we deal with the entire wine value chain. So sustainability right from the fields that uh, the grapes are grown in all the way through to recycling and reuse at the end of the bottle's life. Um, so I, if I talk about what we're doing at SWR, um, it also gives lots of nice sort of needs that these other great people are going to pick up on. A uh, bit about SWR, um, as the name suggests, we do sustainability in wine. Uh, we're a membership organization. We've got about 150 members, um, and those range everything from producers and growers at one end, all the way to retailers at the other, with standard bodies, court makers, smoking manufacturers, all those people in the middle. Some of the names you'll know, Fernand Ricard, Treasure Wine Estates, Little, others you might know less about. So Chateau for example, who are problem style producer. Harlebron University, who are one of the, the leading um, phenological um, universities in Europe. And what we do, we catalyze change. As you're all aware, there's an awful lot of waffle and frankly bullshit in the sort of sustainability space. Um, there's a, therefore, as we were saying actually before we started, an awful lot of cynicism in some quarters of what's actually going on. So what we do at SWR is we develop evidence-based positions that can drive change in the whole industry. And because we've got the whole sector involved, it means it doesn't become, well, this is a retail problem, or this is a producing problem. Actually, it's a thing we all have to do with along the supply chain. So we come up with the evidence base that drives change. A good example of that, which is something that's happened since I was speaking here last year, is the bottle weight of course. Now this specifically covers 750 mil still bottles, but we're going to expand it into uh, sparkling wines as well. We did a piece of research that said, well, how can you reduce wine bottle weight? The bottle is about 50% of the total carbon footprint of wine. So therefore, you reduce the carbon, you reduce the weight of the bottle, you're automatically reducing the carbon footprint of wine. So we have an accord, um, and the participants, of which there are 17, um, have committed to reducing their average bottle weight, the 750 mil still bottles, from a current average of 550 grams down to 420 grams by the end of 2026. So that um, is a 25% saving on the bottle weight, therefore a 12.5% saving in the total carbon footprint of those wines. And of those 17 members, it started off just being retailers. We've now got growers on board as well, and we hope we can get um, Prosecco involved as well. Uh, between them, those participants, between them, make and sell just over a billion bottles of wine. So that's, a, as someone said, that's a pretty decent party. Um, we're moving forward with that. We're starting to look at other aspects of packaging. So we're, getting, we're, we're working on a, a comparison tool to be able to stack up the relative sustainability pros and cons of different alternative formats. Because you look at bottles, obviously they're heavy, um, therefore lots of carbon, so therefore bad, therefore bag and box must be good, doesn't it? Well, bag and box works jolly nicely if you're in Scandinavia where you can recycle the bag. Pretty much nowhere else in the world can you recycle it. Therefore, you gain on the what you gain on the, the carbon swings you lose on the plastics pollution around that. So we're developing a tool to allow comparison between all of those different formats. We're also looking at the whole question of bottle miles. One of the scariest statistics that came out of the work we did last year on bottle weight is that of all the wine bottles used in the United States, 70% are imported from China, which is patently ridiculous from a carbon perspective. But when you actually look at the recycling rates in America, which are very low, therefore it's more economically viable for manufacturers to import those bottles from China. 
So we're, going to, we're developing a, a, a bottle mask company to work out what carbon is embedded in a bottle from the point of, you know, what's the mix that's used in the first to mix it, what's the embedded carbon by the time the bottle gets to where it's made, <coughs> filled, from filled to consumed, recycling down the line. And obviously the data will be fairly rough to begin with, but we want it to drive conversations within the supply chain. So if you have the same demand with a group of uh, California producers, can say, well, let's work with Ferrari, which is their local bottle maker, to say, well, how can we work with our retailers to drive um, higher recycling so that you can make more bottles here? So you can actually have those discussions going along um, uh, through the supply chain. Uh, so that's what we're doing, what we're doing on, on packaging and, and bottle weight. Uh, we're also working on the next question of sustainability standards. Um, I mean, you all know the sort of sustainability standards you get in, in other food types like Fair Trade and Rainforest Alliance. Uh, the wine sector has about 50 of these, um, which yeah, exactly causes quite a lot of confusion. Uh, now, on the one hand, it makes sense because a lot of these standards have emerged from local practice, something like no thy rules or wine sanitation. But if you're a retailer or a consumer and you're looking at a set of bottles, one's got wine sanitation and sustainability standards, another's California Wine Institute, another one's wine from Great Britain, another one's Sweden's from New Zealand, another Swab from Australia. How about you know which one means what. So we've developed something called the Global Reference Framework, which draws not just on sustainability expertise in wine, but also looks at other analogous supply chains. Now, as Neil said, I've worked in what now gets called sustainability for about 30 years. So I've worked in oil and gas, retail, apparel, cotton, palm, cocoa, tea. So we've drawn all of the experience in those sectors as well and developed what they're calling the Global Reference Framework, which is the first global statement of what sustainability in wine actually means. And having done that, we can then compare each of those sustainability standards against that ideal, and then say, right, here's where they do well, here's where the gaps are. So the idea is not just to mark people's homework, although that's going to be part of it, but it's also to say, well, this is how we improve over time. You know, where a standard is weak, say it doesn't cover adequately human rights issues, for example, well, what can we do to help them out? Where a standard is weak because it sets a very low bar uh, entry. Well, how can we help them improve over time? So we'll, we anticipate that that will make transparency across the, the wine value chain much, much greater. And obviously with pressure coming, for, for example, the EU on greenwashing issues, it will really be possible to say, right, this is what this label means, and actually any of the wines over there that have passed this benchmark, you can buy them comfortable that the standard to which those wines are certified demonstrates a plausible journey towards sustainability. Um, we heard a lot just now about inputs. We're about to produce uh, another research piece looking at some uh, uh, chemical inputs. And this came from a number of our uh, grower members saying, you know, we find out, in some, in some cases, quite big ones, and they were saying we're in quite a bind because everyone associates organic and biodynamic equal sustainability. Well, actually, we don't want to be organic. It's not economic for us. Um, it doesn't work with our soil types. It doesn't work with our climate. It doesn't work with our terrain. Um, but yet we think we're, we're farming responsibly. How do we, do we demonstrate that? Um, so we've developed a, what we're going to be calling um, uh, a sustainable viticulture protocol, which will be a principles-based approach to, for growers to be able to say, right, we are aiming towards the least chemical input possible. We are mapping our soils, all the good stuff we heard from Prosecco. Because it, oftentimes you end up with people putting inputs into it, and not just in viticulture, but in other um, farming as well where it's not actually needed. I mean, someone asked a question about what, about the use of chemicals. And what sometimes happens is there's a dosage allowed and farmers will just apply it across the whole farm, whether or not that's needed. So you map your farm to find out what's needed. Um, you then, presumption of minimum use, presumption of using the least toxic um, mix of chemicals available, presumption that you reduce over time. But then what can you do over time to engineer out the, the need for chemicals? Not entirely, but, to a large extent. So that takes you in the direction of regenerative agriculture. So for example, if you use cover crops, you can then mulch those in so you don't need as many fertilizers. We've heard from Prosecco about the use of, you know, of bees mm -hmm. and natural forms of, 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 of animals in the vineyard. All of that is incredibly helpful. So how do you over time get to a point where you can engineer away from the need for as much um, input? So watch out for that. It's going to be launched over the next month or so. Uh, we are also, to pull up on the, the human piece, we're doing work on labour rights um, in, in, uh, in viticulture. Uh, 
where it's, it's a sector that's very far behind elsewhere. And in certain areas, it, it really is almost a word that need not speak its name. But there are some very well documented terrible abuses. Um, I mean, six people died in Champagne in the, in the harvest last year from heat stroke. Um, the French public prosecutor is investigating <coughs> six Bordeaux Chateau for basically gang mastery. So there are some real abuses there, and the sector needs to sort of get live to these. So we did a series of workshops last year to actually raise the agenda. And we're in the process now of working with the Nordic monopolies to develop a, a sort of guidance document to help really develop. Um, a human rights impact assessment approach, and then what do you actually do about it? And this critically comes back to the point that you've been talking about. It's about collaboration. A lot of these issues are not one country specific, and that could be to do with environmental issues like watersheds. It could be to do with human issues like gang masters. It requires a collective approach, which is why we as Estadoir want to work much more closely with people like Prosecco, mm. because those are the vehicles on the ground that, that, that can actually bring those things together. I think also the other point, which again you've mentioned, is about how do you bring the small guys in? Mm. You don't want sustainability to be just the big guys' approach. In the treasury wine states, they grow in California, New Zealand, Australia, they've got a sustainability team of a dozen people. Ratsal Vineyard, which is about five miles from where I live, it's got Joe who owns it, his mum and his mother who run it. They, they don't have enough time. How do you make sure that those get brought along as well? Mm. And I think um, the, the Atlas of the DOC is a, a, a key a key bit that. Um, and lastly, we're, we're working with retailers to try and slimline the process of communication between retailers and producers, because what tends to happen at the moment is all the retailers ask slightly the same question, but not quite the same question, of all the producers who then spend an inordinate amount of time trying to answer the question. So we're trying to streamline that process. So that's what we're working on at the moment. Um, if I get invited back again next year, I'll give you an update. Well, that's where we are for now. So I shall now pass over to East Fan. Come on. Give him a round of applause. Got some great names back there, and it's really important stuff. And actually, that, that sort of collabor collaborative approach has yeah. got to be there. Paul, I know you're going to talk about small producers a little bit later, aren't you, just in terms of your side as an independent mm -hmm. retailer? Just questions, everybody. Anybody got any questions that are rolling along? Please, don't be shy. Just, yeah. Thank you. Right, shout it out. Hey, so, um, Peter, I'm really pleased that Rob from uh, Wedding Room. Hello. Pleased to hear you mention the carbon footprint of the bottles and such a transparent amount. It's really cool. Um, you know, bagging box, I guess, doesn't work for, for Prosecco. Um, <laughs> what about cans? We see one of the things that's been quite interesting is we're, as we're digging into this, this discussion, you start to have um, more of a thought that it could be situationally specific. And we've been talking recently to Bogle, which is a California producer, and they've started doing an aluminium bottle. It yep. looks like a bottle, but it's not. It is, it, that, and then there are arguments, a lot of California coastline, you want to go and sit and watch the sunset. You can't take a bottle in case it breaks on the beach. And then you, yeah. So one of those works. Marks and Spencers and Waitrose have both introduced cans for their small serve. Yeah. Um, and again, that makes sense, because how many of us buy of those on the train, on the way home, some idiot with his bloody laptop bag not clear them all over your computer, and it's just a complete pain in the proverbial. Whereas a can is much more convenient. So a, a ditto with bag in box, as long as you can find a way of dealing with the recycling, actually, Wine Society last year produced their white burgundy in a 2.2 by litre box, and their selling point was it fits on the bookshelf. So rather than having a whole bunch of um, bottles swilling around the fridge, it's neat. So I think. What's going to be quite interesting is at least having the data underlying to say what, what are the relative merits and demerits of different formats. What people then do with that is up to them. But I think it's having a, a shared evidence base that people can proceed from. And if that means you end up with different formats used for different occasions, that seems to me to be a great thing. Which is great. The Prospecto Consortium spent 250 grand in December on an anti can and draft campaign, right? And that feels like a furious approach, you know? Um, well, we did we did that because, hold on, I'm just going to ask yeah. this question. Uh, because the thing is, we have, we still, you know, part one of the things is, yeah. and, and Flavia mentioned that, is people who are trying to produce Prosecco with one letter different, yep. as you well know, yep. and we work very closely with the Food Standards Board here, the Food yep. Standards Board. Yep. And one of the things we had also was the fact that people were, and we 
done as well, but actually we did have examples as we well know people come stay with a certain protector on tap or people going around in bands to protect on yep. tap. So you know we have to be protect ourselves there. And that's what we did. <coughs> well, you know, you, 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 you protect yourself, so you can we had to do that and we felt things have improved in that way. Could that change in the future? Yeah. Uh, I think no. we we are looking no we, what we're doing at the moment we are no I think, but I think one of the things we are doing is you've got you've got producers who are using lighter bottles as much as they can because you have some examples here you know so that is something actually Andrea was talking to me about so what we're doing that so we're taking more of that course and that one there so but yeah you know we're just we are there's a protection element as well. Yeah. But what I understand is so you know as you mentioned the, please mentioned the, the shelf in Waitrose the can shelf. Mm. All the you know, RTD cocktails, all in cans, still wines, all in cans. The last skews left in bottles are the sparkling wines, right? Mm. And I just, I don't, I just don't quite understand the resistance when, when, when the when the carbon footprint is. It, it, it's if you want to start reducing the carbon footprint, something it's half, it's fifty percent of the carbon footprint. Well, one of the we, we're finding, and it's I just pick up on that point. There is wine is particularly an old world. It's slightly different in New Zealand and Australia. Wine in the old world is a very traditional business. Yeah. And there are still quite a lot of people that will say, why do you do that? Well, we've always done it. You know, my great, 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 great grandfather did it. And so what we've found we've had to do, and you know, maybe you find the same with Prosecco, is you have to move those people who want to move, then demonstrate to those who might be more resistant, look, it's not too painful, is it? And then they feel more comfortable coming forwards. When my background is in conflict resolution, uh, you know, always the issue is you get some of the parties at the table. And then others feel more comfortable to join yeah. them at some stage down the line, and it's uh, and it's easy to criticise, of course, because it is a frankly a no-brainer. But telling them that isn't perhaps totally tactical. Um, but if they can see that others are moving, I mean, this is, for example, yeah. without without bottle waste pool, it's an average of four hundred and twenty grams. Because what we didn't want was that I mean, Amarone, an Amarone producer, or someone in California meant that the average. Was still higher, so what you, you, everything couldn't go down that road. But if you can get to the stage where others are moving, they're seeing that it works perfectly well, then it's there's less reason for others to follow. And I think you might well find the same with with, with cans and prosecco. But it's a traditional business; they've always done it this way. They start to see others doing it. You know, perhaps some of the newer producers are moving in that direction. It means the other ones are going to feel more comfortable following. I think we had a question here as well. Yes, you you hit on most of it actually. Um, as someone who judges not only Prosecco but sparkling wines on a pretty constant basis, the weight of bottles is, even in Prosecco with the Cartice and Arrive, it's huge. <clears throat> it's enormous. Well, the biggest, the biggest. And, and I mean, if we go to the still wines, California is ridiculous. The heaviest we found in our research was an Amarone. And the empty bottle came in at 2.8 kilos. Uh, <laughs> point is, that so that's an offensive weapon. Absolutely. But the problem is that it's seen as a large of status. But the, the, the funny thing is that is not borne out by the consumer in, in Uh depends on which consumer. No. Well, it, yeah, I mean, so in California. My neck of the woods. But in California, and, but if you look at globally, the evidence, if you go through all the academic studies, the evidence is not there to justify that. It's something that a lot of people in the industry feel that they want to have and maintain. But there's little evidence that that's... If you give a consumer two bottles, and you say one's better wine, one's better, a worse wine, they'll say the one that has a bottle is the best wine. Frankly, most of the time, people buying wine, you buy it online, or you're looking at a whole bunch of other factors as well. And the bottle weight is not a factor. Actually, in America, it is. Oh, that's right, actually. I'm not saying it isn't anyway, but generally it isn't. Okay. Thanks, Patricia. Enough. Thanks, Patricia. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> no, I'm actually, I'll tell you why. Because, actually, they're just talking about price and buying. Shane, we're going to come in here because one of the things we were talking about the other day, sustainability, and, you know, and in some cases, what are people prepared to pay? Exactly. Um, I'm going to speak very, very briefly because this man here is just such a font of knowledge. <laughs> Literally, I think it's written in the book. Well, I have a link there. So absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it was just absolutely it's fascinating, just, just you know, going into that. So, I'm Shane Holland, I'm the executive chair of Slow Food in the UK. Slow Food, as you probably all know, is the world's largest food and drink NGO. We work in 150 countries. 
Um, we do lots of very similar work to what Peter does, actually. We work in things like Coca, and we work in coffee. Um, it depends where we are in the world and what it is we're actually doing. Here in Europe, we're doing an enormous amount of work around sustainability. We produce the world's best-selling sustainability guide, which is why we started a partner um, with Lars Lovely. That, of course, is the Slow Wine Guide. More than a million copies of that are being sold a year. And you, um, you sponsor the Sustainability and Sparkling Wine Awards also each year. With uh, a few good wineries that have won, so we're very appreciative of that as well, James. Thank you. And see the trophy outside. I think actually, outside, yes. we, we really do, as an industry and as a stand, actually, as a body of people interested in sustainability, have an enormous debt to people like Paul like Chris and, and Eve, but also the Prosecco DOC, for thinking about these things and putting these issues out there. And that's really what I'm going to speak about. I'm going to speak you know, fairly, fairly. Um, um, Sorry, with brevity. I wasn't going to say brevity, wasn't I? I'm trying to read my own handwriting. So that's that's uh, last for a second. I'm not going to say 100 words when 10 would do, and I'm trying to keep it nice short. But anyway, where are consumers at the moment? Now, consumers, as we all know, will say that they want things, they say they will want to do things, and they don't always follow through. And um, we've had a cost of living crisis, and actually, much of my work here in the UK is actually working around food access and how people can access food, you know, quality food and quality drink. In fact, as soon as I leave here, I'm going to the Houses of Parliament, we've got the All Party Group on Poverty, publishing its documents there about access to food and drink. So I do a lot of work in this sector. Now, obviously, when we're speaking about quality of wine, that perhaps is slightly out of that remit, but actually, again, consumers are spending less. So in 2022, we've got some Nielsen data, and the reason I'm giving you the provider of the data is you can pick a survey, pick the person, and the percentage is always very little bit. But the reason I like Nielsen data is Nielsen, what they actually do is they actually look at actual shopping data and then look at consumers afterwards. They can triangulate that data. 66% of consumers in 2022, the last time we got full data, said they were actively looking to buy sustainable products. Now I leave it to you of what sustainable means. As Peter was saying, sustainable can mean pretty much anything you want. So I think lots of other colleagues are going to say some very, very similar things. There are too many legal definitions on what sustainable is. We can look at standards which are coming in from the consortium and so forth, which is why we're so in favour of those, because those then actually have some substance behind it. But the word sustainability, what does that mean? We can take our pick, we can just choose what that means. But 12% of that 66% um, said they would pay a premium. Um, so they are willing to pay a premium for those, for those um, products, and they're willing to pay, again, roughly another 12% um, over what they would pay on a standard item, if that can be demonstrated to be um, genuinely um, sustainable. What sustainable is, I leave to you. That has decreased. So before the cost of living crisis, the median um, amount of consumers that were looking for sustainable products was about 71%. I know I'm tossing stats at you. But, so we have seen that decrease. And that is because consumers have been trading down. But we get to tipping points. As I was saying to some colleagues earlier when we were, sat, when we were waiting to come in, consumers buy with their pocket today. So I'm making a purchase, I'm buying what's in my pocket, but they buy with their values tomorrow. But tomorrow sometimes never comes. But it's really, really important because as businesses, there's that lag. We're producing, if we're going to invest in CapEx, if we're actually going to do something, we have to anticipate what consumers are doing. Last year when we were here, we were speaking about how the previous 12 months were the hottest on record. We're here again 12 months later, the last 12 months were the hottest on record. Now there's a point to this, in that if we go back into the 1980s, and um, some, some of us here may not remember this, the hole in the ozone there, but there was a hole in the ozone there, it's in, it was in, um, in the mm -hmm. Antarctic. And that hole in the ozone there was known for quite a period of time. It used to appear periodically in the news, um, and businesses were aware that CFCs were driving those things. Now, as businesses, they wanted to change those things. It took a lot of capex to, to drive that. And then one year, this became an enormous piece of news. And the reason that year was it became an enormous piece of news, it was an El Nino year. We're in an El Nino year now. And when you're in El Nino years, in Europe, at least in the south of Europe, you have enormously high temperatures. So the prediction this year is that Europe is going to be hot. We're likely to be warmer than average. Today is weather, but obviously that trend. And suddenly on the news, there's this, this connection that actually the hole in the ozone layer, even though it was in the Antarctic, even though we were in summer in Europe, it was incredibly hot. And in the Antarctic, we were in the middle of winter, so it was probably minus 40, and in complete darkness. 
that suddenly we hit this tipping point, that there was this connection, that something was happening in the world, and something had to be done. And something had to be done overnight. And that's what happened with the whole of the ozone layer. It was known about for many, many years. Suddenly, legislation came in, because consumers suddenly were demanding it. They asked it, they asked their elected officers to do something about it, and we had change. We are going to have something similar within, within sustainability, within carbon. We know these things are here. We know the world is warming up. Chris was saying that sustainability is contentious. I, I found a wonderful piece of data from the ONS. The ONS um, went out after COP26 and did a State of the Nation survey. Again, you can look this up. And it said that 1% of people didn't actually deliberately shop for, um, for sustainability. They actually were actively anti sustainability shopping. So they were deliberately looking for the least, um, you know, for the most harmful, effectively, who the 1% of people are. But as you say, it's not <coughs> as contentious. We are on a tipping point. And that's a problem for business. Maybe one question, actually, I was going to mention it when I had an introduction. Mm. Obviously, the, the, the production side of sustainability is a massive amount of work going on. That's in the background. The consumer going into the supermarket doesn't necessarily see that. They just recognise a logo on the bottle, which is fantastic to see. And I think we've mentioned that there's different kind of variations of that logo, mm. maybe what does sustainability mean. But then are some of the consumers ready for the changes that may come about with at the consumer end of the scale. So we're looking at corks. I mean, I was in Champagne region the other day. We we're all familiar with the foil on the top of a bottle, but here's paper. So things are changing. Would you think the consumers would say, wait a minute, I, I like my Prosecco in a glass bottle and this plastic bottle, am I getting enough money back? Even though the sustainability value is undoubtedly very important for many of us, are they willing to take that change very, very quickly? Or do we have to maybe get some reports from the consumers more to say, would you be prepared to accept a not a plastic bottle, obviously not, but a, a non-glass bottle or a thinner glass bottle, and you still get the, the, the quality of Prosecco inside that bottle. Are they ready to take that journey with us? Let's put it this because we're in the industry, we make the decisions, and the consumers are actually funding that industry. Are they willing to take that journey with us? It's just a question. Some are now, absolutely. Yeah. The colleagues here will also, will also chip in on this. Some are absolutely now. And I think if we're looking at the premium end of the industry, the, you know, the people who are buying at the premium, um, um, amounts, um, they're certainly more educated. They're also getting education because they're purchasing perhaps from independents, where they're, you know, you've actually got someone you can have that kind of dialogue with you. Um, if you're buying on the entree and say from restaurants and so forth, you have a sommelier there who can give you that education. That's very, very different than if we're going into a multiple outlet and we're purchasing something entirely on price when literally they're spinning on pennies. That is very, very different. And I think the whole thing around whether it's corks and bottles and things, there's someone called um, Dr. Charles Spence, many of you will have heard of him. Um, he is a professor of, of, of um, sensory, I don't know, that's the title, isn't it? But he, what he actually does, he investigates things like smell and weights of glasses and weights of bottles, actually, um, mm -hmm. and their perceived value. And there is something there which says, actually, that the tactility of items mm -hmm. will influence a purchase and will make you decide whether it's luxurious or not, whether or not expensive or not. Um, I don't know what Charles Spence would say about um, a, a paper cork. Um, but maybe well, then we've changed. If you're about, especially in the old world, maybe there's certain characteristics that we're looking for. But in the new world, you know, we, we have screw caps on, on, on wines, and you know, but maybe for a Bordeaux, you're expecting corks. I, 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 I don't know. But with the changes here, that was a subtle thing. It doesn't bother me, and I'm quite sure it wouldn't bother like 9% of people. So if those subtle changes could be made, we could achieve an awful lot with the end consumer that drives the industry. And, and maybe that will come in time. Again, when I used to ro ro operate restaurants, you know, if you saw selling caps, that was good to get. No one would, would want to buy, even though you know, they're Sauvignon Blanc to be much fresher. And today, the reverse is the case. You know, yeah. someone gave me you know, Sauvignon Blanc to put a cork in, yeah. and I'm almost getting suspicious. Is this going to be, going to have those nice fresh flavours? Yeah. 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 Just a quick note on Dr. Charles Spence. Could you give a talk, I believe, where he said that when the schools are, the night on the fourth are much heavier, yeah. the the same with wine glasses. So if you buy wine, if you're selling wine by the glass, and you're just free pouring, so you're giving a glass of wine, um, the perception of the person of what they're willing to pay for that glass um, is greater if the, if the glass itself is weighted. Um, mm. So it, it does matter. I don't have the data on wine bottles, but there is a, there is a good body of work that he does. Shane, thank you very much. Big round of applause for Shane.
I see them from really sort of coming from a punter's perspective, which actually is a sort of link with the piece of talking about consumers, where are we at with consumers, with some consumers and some you know, wanting to know more, etc. And some say, well, I'm just talking to them. You know, I need to, am I ready to make that next step? So, Ellen, your perspective. It's a good job I can look at it from a punter's point of view, given everyone in this room probably has more wine knowledge than me. Um, but yeah, being a journalist, I write for a whole variety of publications, which means I look constantly at what essentially consumers want to read <coughs> or they want to find out about through the kind of lens of what editors want them to write about. So I think some of these questions come up quite regularly, you know, we think it's great, I want to pitch a sustainability piece and an editor will say, the readers don't really care about that, what they care about is affordability and we're in the middle of cost of living crisis, so to come back to what you guys were saying. Um, I mean we've all got tons of stats that we can chuck around, but yeah, you know, the stats say Everybody wants uh, more sustainable stuff, but by the way, they're not willing to pay for it, which is the, the crux of the issue, isn't it? Um, so I found some. I found some of your stats. Yeah, but I found some of my own. Um, some of the Deloitte ones, which I thought kind of tie in with the area that I would want to um, look at, really, which is the kind of um, Deloitte did a study that looked at people's various aspects around sustainability, including people's. Reasons not to adopt a more sustainable lifestyle, and among that was kind of the cost, predominantly 62% of people saying that that was a barrier. Um, also, lack of interest, which is basically summed it up sometimes, doesn't it? Uh, consumers, are, are they that bothered? Your average consumer, I mean, we're in a room of people who care about these things, but you know, punter girl here wonders what people care about, you know, the ones who do buy their wine from the supermarket. Or who also, I mean, you know, sidebar, I think we tend to put people into brackets, don't we? So we either have people who shop in independent wine retailers or we have the people that go to supermarkets. When realistically, a lot of consumers are both. A lot of consumers, you know, they're having a dinner party, so they'll go to the independent wine retailers for some good recommendations. They'll also probably stock up on five or six bottles that are the quaffing ones for the end of the meal because nobody wants the guests to be drinking the really good wine when they're all half cut. So like, we don't all necessarily fall very neatly into these gaps uh, or into these boxes. Um, so kind of when it comes to sustainability, it's a similar thing. We all, most consumers do want to be more sustainable, but it, it, there's a time and a place sometimes for these things. Um, in terms of another barrier to adopting that sustainable lifestyle is the lack of information. And I think that kind of really interests me. Information and trust and the way the way that we get the word out about this stuff, um, like my esteemed colleagues were saying, um, you know, who do you, how do you trust? Everybody's bandying the word sustainable around, it's everywhere. Uh, the big brands use it very, very cleverly. Um, not sure how much they actually care about it, you know, like it's ticking a box, isn't it? We have to tick in the ESG box these days. Um, so, and cons so consumers don't really know where they stand. They want to do this stuff, but they don't know how, where. So the idea maybe of more, you know, something that's a bit simpler, a bit easier for people to understand, but I think as a, you know, do, doing what I do is quite important for consumers. Um, and the kind of authenticity side of it, um, we see a lot of greenwashing around and, and you know, as ever, this isn't a swipe at anybody in particular, but authorities are always the last to catch up on putting kind of standards in place, keeping up with, you know, the way that big business is, or small business, is kind of leveraging this stuff to get sales. Um, and as much as we would love to think that lots of producers and companies, obviously everyone in here accepted, and the several here accepted, um, you know, the reason why they're talking about sustainability is not necessarily because they value sustainability. It's because they think that's ticking a box. So the sooner that various kind of authorities and bodies can catch up with that and come up with some kind of benchmarking mm. that is not just um, highfalutin and you know very kind of data led, but that also is communicated in a way to the consumer, they can actually understand that and get behind that um, and then decide for themselves. Um, and I think it's interesting when we were talking about you know, how can we lead consumers to, towards that and whether there will be any resistance by consumers. Um, consumers are always quite resistant to change in my experience. Um, and sometimes you've kind of got to push them. You know, we didn't, I remember as a kid, you know, switching from glass milk bottles to plastic milk bottles. It's entirely the norm now that you would expect to buy your milk in a plastic bottle, but consumers didn't like it. 
Um, you know, the idea of canned wine, the idea of screw tops. It, you know, for a long time, people were resistant to it. Are they now not buying it? No, not really. It's about kind of communicating that, marketing it, and how we tell those stories. Um, I think in your world, it's telling those stories authentically, um, which wine does have on its side. You are an industry that tells stories very, very well, whether it's vineyards, whether it's producers, whether it's consortia, you, you do kind of tell those stories authentically and well. And I do think that that will be the key really when it comes to this stuff. Uh, in making it believable for the consumer because that's when they get behind things, really. So I'm probably going to be the shortest one, but I figure you can all just enjoy the picking from your prosecco <laughs> and move on to someone more knowledgeable. That's yeah, my kind of like my stance on it, really. Thank you. I'm going to ask a point actually. Just in, for those, there's some educators here, right? Who's a wine educator? We've got some wine educators, haven't we? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Do you? Do you? Feel, <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> But actually, do you feel, <laughs> let's say we are talking about sustainability to an audience now, is it, is it developing? Is, it res is the response more positive? Or do you think, let's say even a year ago, let's say for those who came to the last year, do you feel any, anything much has changed during that period? Just picking up on Ellen's point, really, about how we're talking about this stuff. What do you feel about the response? Yeah, I think, think people are certainly interested and keen, but like you say, it's press-led. Um, you know, at the end of the day, there are very few people, I think, who will, as you said, it was 12%, was it? Um, who will pay extra for something like that. Yes. Yeah. So in terms of when you're running your, I'm just going to Patricia, yeah. yeah. Just when you're doing, does it Darren Thompson want to have that okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm quite blatant about stuff, okay. Uh, but, but it's now, Darren's doing a lot of, you're doing a lot of education. So I, I just want to just feel as though, Abby was here last time about talking about wine education, weren't we? And um, just as what do we feel we're making progress? I think we're making progress, but it's only if you see anything that is going to take up on it. And I think they are picking up on it. I think just putting it in there, I always make sure there's some few relevant slides and uh, presentations that and they are interesting. And that is that is enough, as you say, to kind of get start the And the storytelling, as I said, storytelling yeah. is key. We have to something that we can tell stories, we can grab people in the vineyard <coughs> and there's a story to be told, pushing that sustainability mm. angle with that story will lead the decision. Okay, that's, that's right. I mean, I'm just interested because you know, we, we're trying to think, hey, this is happening, but how, how is it happening and how quickly, and, and what we're picking up on some of the stats and the comments. Who's just another question? Uh, comment more. Okay. Uh, most of the education I do that is not related to teaching students is, I will go with upper middle class groups, and their first question is, what does sustainable mean? And because there is not a definition, they don't care. We've, we've touched on that, we yeah. touched on that earlier on, didn't we? And Vicky, you were talking yeah. about this. We need to find it. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. we've got to we can out yeah. yeah. other people. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Right. interestingly enough, we actually would have had a piece of paper in front of each other with the phones, and we're turning into your phones, and we said, write down what sustainability means. It'd be interesting to read some of them out, because yeah. that is a critical part of it. But I, it's just, I'm just trying to work out the engagement, how we present it, yeah. Are we just getting on the, are we getting on the bike? I'm going to go actually. Oh, I'm going to go actually to Luma first because sure. I want to just carry on the. <laughs> I was so close. Cool, I said, "I'll tell you what. No, no, no. We're going to change. We're going to change. It's a live show. <laughs> you look. You look like he was going to run the Olympic 100 metres. I mean, it was just. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, yes. we're going to, actually, Luma, you can do both these sections together. So, Al Wilson, Cambridge Wine Merchants, is going to talk about independence being a bit of about some of the things about some more producers. Go for it, Al. Yeah. You, you've got to get out the box, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. So, I'm Al Wilson. Uh, so, I own Cambridge Wine Merchants, and we've been independent merchants for 30 uh, odd years. And during that time, I think, you know, we've all grown up a lot in our understanding of the need for, um, to, you know, to be more sustainable in our lives. And there is still this huge emotional push and pull. Um, you know, wine is, is an emotional purchase, really. We don't need to buy it. We, we buy it because we 
like to buy it. Um, you know, and that you know, and, and what we buy is um, you know, is going to be affected by quite a lot of different factors. And so, in our business, I think you Shane was saying sixty six percent said they're interested in in sustainability. Twelve percent of that sixty six said they might do something about it or prepared to pay a, a bit more. So that's slightly under eight percent of of the total group that's been asked. That might be quite a lot of overlap in terms of my customer base, if, if I can sort of put my in, uh, independent hat on, we probably sort of 5% of, uh, of the market, um, and people come to us knowing probably they're gonna be spending more than they are spending uh, in, a, in a supermarket, or more than they could. So we're already in, in, a, in a sort of non-intentional uh, or non um, important um, item uh, uh, of purchase of people coming to us. So the sustainability, you know, we can push quite strongly at people. But I've, I've yet to find somebody who's gone out of, of one of my shops with a big smile on, on their face because they bought something that was sustainable. So we, we need to make this somehow sexier or more interesting or more just absolutely mandatory than it is at the moment. And I, you know, and I stand up and I talk, and we all do, about the need for sustainable um, wine making and sustainable decisions in our lives and in our in our purchasing. And people sort of nod, um, and sometimes that nod becomes a little bit sort of heavy. So we we're trying to make this easy for people to understand. I've got a quick question for Peter. Does the whole wine, in, you know, if you take the whole wine industry as a whole, you've worked in lots of other industries. Are we doing an okay job? Are we ahead of the curve? Are we sort of in the middle of the road, or have we got lots of catching up to do with other industries? Yes, yes, or no. Yeah. Well behind the curve, but well behind the curve. To, to, to pick up on the racing analogy, come up fast on the rim. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we might be in a, in a position to sort of help people coming in. Um, I'm sure it's true of all supermarket buyers as well, but you know, I can decide what sort of producer I want to work with. Lots of producers that I do work with can't work with, you know, very large um, supermarkets or, or, or national accounts because they're small. They're also often multi-generational family businesses. They're living and working on the land, and they have a product which takes generations um, to grow and to turn into something truly wonderful. So um, I think those producers that we work with, that we choose to work with them, already are, are, you know, are dedicated to living a sustainable life. Because they want their children and grandchildren to take over that business and to have a business left over. Um, and we've spoken about why sustainability is quite difficult for people to get their heads around. Um, and you know, my, my sort of Venn diagram has organic and it has biodynamic and it has sort of sustainable. But they don't, you know, it's not as if sustainable sort of captures everything. You could probably be biodynamic, but have pretty poor water resource management in your business. Perhaps because it rains all the time. Um, but you could, you know, it, these things don't overlap. In our business, we've done something to sort of be the arbiter a little bit in pushing customers. I don't like calling them consumers. I do like calling them wine drinkers and wine lovers, but pushing wine lovers without too much effort towards the most sustainable choice possible. Partly by buying as sustainable as we can. People are coming to me, they're gonna be paying twice the national average for, for a bottle of wine. They should be able to, so I should be able to build in sustainability in that. In fact, there's a virtuous circle between um, you know, sustainable use Often that means lower yields, um, often that means higher quality, often that means higher cost, and people are coming to me for quality, so they're paying a little bit more, but they're getting sustainability, sustainability built in. If every buyer said that they had to, be, had to be working with sustainable producers and came up with good definitions for what that meant, um, then I think we would be in a very good place to, almost force people 
to take the sustainable option because we're running out of uh, options for people not to take the sustainable route. Um, um, I was talking to Shane about this uh, this comedy program, The Good Place. I don't know if we've, we've seen it, but basically, um, you know, somebody wakes up, they, they, they've died, they're in the good, they're told they're in the good place. It, it, it soon turns out that they're, they're not. Spoiler alert. Um, it happens quite quickly, isn't it? But there's a wonderful um, episode where actually living well enough to get into the good place is really difficult in modern life because we're all interconnected. Our tomatoes come from the other side of the world. How sustainable is that? Mm -hmm. Our glass comes from Ukraine and our, you know, or, or from China. Uh, and, you know, even if our wine is is made close, it's very difficult to have wine miles that make sense. Peter's doing great work on that. We do it as simplistically as possible, and really, for those wines, we have handwritten um, cards for, for all of our wines. Um, if that comes with a sustainable headline on a green, a light green base, there is something about that. It could be that they've, they've achieved some sustainability uh, certification. They might be certified orga organic or biodynamic, but they also might not be, because actually becoming organic uh, in certain years actually is more trouble than it's, than it's worth, because you, know, you want to make something good at the end of the day. Um, so, so we are sort of the gatekeepers sort of the arbiters, we take that very seriously. So, it, you know, it's not saying we can we sort of put a green sticker on and it's be tangential. That's really at the heart of how we go about wine. We want to be better at it. We all buy with our head and our heart, and sometimes I'm buying even Prosecco on a cost basis. Um, I know, sorry. <laughs> um, and the... The, you know, the way for, for us to make sure people do have a smile on their face is that they have you know, high quality and good price, and that we sort of insist that they're buying sustainably as much as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to say one quick thing, a great opportunity for Prosecco in this panel. Yeah. So, we've talked about it. Come on, let's have a question. Uh, this is um, Amanda from Drink With Me. This is just a comment on your piece. I think you've hit the nail on the head, I think. Consumers don't know what sustainability means, and consumers don't care what sustainability means. And if we as a trade want our wines to be sustainable, it's up to us here in this room and trade bodies to get together along with Peter and to find out what that definition is and for us to just do it and not expect a pat on the back or a medal for doing it. Just It just has to be like a grape is in wine, so the wine is sustainable. If that's what you want, that's what we just have to do and not expect the consumer to care. So we're going to be forced to do it anyway. Pardon? We're going to be forced yeah. to do it. Yeah, we'll There's going to be more and more regulation from yeah. from consortio, yeah. from yeah. You know, from governments. Yeah. We have to do it. We might as well do it with a with a smile on our face as we're being dragged <laughs> along. And and but but do it you know uh, emotionally and you know and, and with real intention. I think that's that's the way to do it. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Question. <coughs> but um, we actually said also as a panel we are going to smile. Because it does frustrate him, I go. And we said, you know, we are actually smiling, and you're even smiling too, which we really appreciate. Uh, but there's too many panels you go to, it just drives them. Just a smile back. Yeah, there's a smile back. Right, I appreciate, look, we started late, okay? So, uh, that's my fault. So, we started late, so I apologise for that. But we're just going to do 10 minutes more, and then what we're going to do is just take questions. But you can also come and ask questions afterwards yes. as well. Uh, the other thing is, the panel is actually going to do a quick 30 second story at the end as well. Yeah, interesting yeah, with the comments we've had. I'm really pleased we're getting more questions this year, of course. Right, Luma Montero. Now, Luma's going to do two things at once here now. <laughs> <laughs> you're a person, you're ready to come out the blocks. Yeah, 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 two yeah. jobs. So you're running 200 meters here. So you're going <laughs> to talk about, actually, talk about the, the entree piece, because having just heard from Hal about independence, talk about Davis, and then move into your piece about, as an Instagram, or the massive following about life as an Instagram and sustainability. Luna Montero. So I do actually have two mics, maybe more than two. <laughs> um, I have a, a very op an optimistic point of view, actually, because I was collating numbers before I came. And uh, so I'll talk about Davis first, and then I'll talk about Wayne Maria. They both, in, at some point, they are together because one brings competitive to the other. So Davis, I am, so Davis of London is the name of the company, but I work for one branch of the company called Davis Wine Merchants. 
find the marketing manager for trade. So trade fund one is the, what I think of. This is my full time job. My second time job is a, <laughs> is a one communicator and then I, is when I work with producers outside of the English majors, they sometimes they mix match. But, uh, uh, and then I work with, uh, and I write for a couple of magazines and uh, go ahead. Uh, but Instagram is surely where I communicate with followers. And uh, so for Davis, because I deal specifically with trade, we most of the portfolio now of Davis is 65% with some <coughs> level of certification. Could be sustainable certification, it could be having an American sun, uh, could be organic, could be bioorganic. So we did a study and it was an exhaustive one because I had all the data and we had 65% Why we did we had to do that was not an option because some of the tenders we did with big you know chains that we supply to because we supply as the trade we supply for Davis uh, London Davis of London which is the bus so we have this study with our bus and uh, we also sell to other companies right in the tenders was an obligation to declare which ones were certified organic or vegan so which means the customers, maybe they don't know what they are asking for, but they are asking for it. Or add value if a customer wants to sell, if, if a trade wants to sell to a customer and they are like, okay, I don't know what it is. They might not know, I don't know, but they are asking for it. Or add value, even though they don't know what they are asking for. Mm. And then when I go to the Davies bus, which we have 17 in London, and we supply as a merchant, to the days my boss and I also did the wine list for them so I know the wines very well <laughs> we had to change some wines on the list and uh, and start adding the same ones if they are organic if they are biodynamic we had to do this whole work because we perceived in advance the customers are willing to change for an option that has a sustainability accreditation which was very interesting I don't have the number And um, what was it that missing? Ah, and I was telling about I was giving choices of sustainable uh, process for summer last year. Uh, all these posts together, they had an increase in five point five percent in the and watching videos, right? And I'm saying about and I'm comparing with the same format of kind of videos I do with all the producers, right? Even though what I was thinking about. Even though people do not know, they want to know, because biodynamics is a little bit, you know, blurred lines, no one can understand. Regenerity, no one kind of understands as well. So I looked at it, the numbers, and 5.5 for Instagram really means a lot. It's, it's, it's a big number. Because we work with, you know, 
influencing where the 31, 2% and the 5.5 of those really surprised us all. Um, and also, uh, I, try, I try also to, if, we, if a barista is doing anything that I think is quite interesting or you know, sustainable in any way, even if they don't have reputation, I add that. Because I think I add value from where they're sitting. Because I think this generation now, more than ever, I think we are really worried, because you know, it's the year to remember, what's going to happen in the future. So we are trying to protect as much as we can. And I think even though we don't know, we feel guilty if you are drinking something that does not have anything. And I was looking at Bordeaux the other day. Um, Bordeaux is a very traditional region, so I think <coughs> everyone knows that. But if you look at some producers there, most of them, and I don't know numbers, could be 30 could be 60, I don't know. They are really doing something uh, sustainable in the vineyards. I'm saying because the last producers I've been working with or writing about them or saying something they were like, oh, also, we do this in the vineyard, right? We are doing this or that. There is a, a group that is quite famous now. Uh, they call it, ah, it works again. Oh, it's the YouTube. <laughs> this the organic, uh, the organic group. Four cuts of ten, then three. <laughs> and uh, so when that, actually, was this conflict of interest here. <laughs> uh, and they, they do this beautiful work, you know. Um, and most of the producers now are looking at it. They are, what we can do that can, you know, offset a little bit of the carbon print. And uh, yeah, so this is looking both sides. Mm. Um, and I think they are really feeling more and more that they have to do something. And I think the consumers, even though they don't know, they are making choices based on like, you know, are you doing something sustainable? Luma, when you talking about sustainable, then you said actually what I'm doing is I, if I, I want to find something interesting. <coughs> what would that be? I don't know if you just say, you just saying, well, I can't, I like this, but I've, I've got to find something in there. So for me personally, and then it's me as my way of writing for Instagram, right, apart from babies. <laughs> um, I talk about vineyards all the time, right? And then soils and, you know, what is beautiful. What is different for me is like, what, with this you have, or with like these vineyards you have, how you, how you be in, making sure that this is still going to be biodiversity. This is what I do. So I look if they are doing something on cover crops, I do that. I look like, okay, so what, every time I'm going to vineyard, I'm like, oh, so do you do something here? Is it this? Do you harm, you know, these chemicals, your mm. soil? Mm. Or what are you doing to create biodiversity? So I ask the questions. And when I ask the questions and I have like, I receive back whatever they are doing as a practice, I try to at least make a note about them when I'm writing about them. It's just because I think for me, for me it's important because I feel guilty if I'm drinking a wine that has nothing. It's just like you know, this is what we do. This is the way it is. So I, it doesn't, you know, doesn't work anymore. I think. Would we agree with that? Do you feel that? Yeah. Is that something? Okay. To a point, your storytelling, the limit telling story, you're interested more. In learning through you yeah. at five percent, that's huge. A lot of us are on social media, that's huge. Yeah. Jump in, people watching. Mm -hmm. Actually, people are interested when you give them that little bit of knowledge to learn. Uh, that's great that you're seeing that with these different farming practices and churches. Hopefully, sustainability can be part of that five percent jump. That people are interested and want to learn more. You have to explain, you know, you, you have to. Yeah. That's the reason I think it's important when I do this in small ones, like okay. I'm talking about regenerative, what does it mean? Mm -hmm. You have to come back and explain yeah. because people do not know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Uh, quick question, just quick along. I'm actually a big sparkling uh, lover wine in general, but we're here at the Glass of Budbury Sparkling Wine Summit, but this panel has just been broadly about sustainability. Is there anything about sparkling that they need to consider more or are already doing more? That's a good question. <laughs> well, we are excited. Yeah, well, I don't know. Thank you for the question, too. <laughs> uh, I think broadly the issues are the same. I mean, I think the, the obvious way in which the, the obvious one that's different is about the bottle. Um, because the, obviously it's the, the question is a different question to be asked, asked there. But otherwise, think about all the rest of it. You know, you're looking at practices and whether the grapes get used 
and sparkling wine or a silver wine. The issues around regen, around organic practice, around or, or, you know the, the, the farming practices remain the same. If you look at the confusion of standards, people okay fine, you know, some applies to sparkling wines and some applies to silver wines. But that lack of transparency about what do they actually mean is still the case. Um, you look at the onward supply chain. Um, well, you can at least bulk ship some sparkling wines as you can still wine. So that, that sort of onward supply chain ceases the same. And then in retail as well, you know, how, how the bottles then recycle, or how alternative formats are used. So broadly, the issues, I think, are the same. But you could also say the same for almost any agricultural supply chain. You know, the, the, the issues are often the same. It's just a question of understanding farm by farm. Budget, budget, budget. What do you need to do? I think, I think arguably, sorry, just yeah. arguably from a consumer point of view, actually, Prosecco especially, it kind of it has this, this great positioning that is quite forward thinking. Uh, Prosecco is the thing that the kids are drinking because it's okay, it's become cool, uh, it's affordable, it's, it's slightly, you know, slightly lower in ABV. And so it's actually in terms of nudging them in the right direction, in terms of saying, you know, it's, I mean, I know there was the stuff about the kind of like having to protect it. But in terms of saying, do you know what, we're not hanging on to this kind of like old school, this is the way we do it. I think there's a bit of an opportunity then. I mean, it's in terms of pushing forward and doing things a bit differently, you know, I don't, I don't really know. And it's just push by the books, yeah. On top, yeah, yeah. On top, yeah. 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 Push by the top. I think one of the other aspects nudge strategy. I'm wondering if we're doing a bottle way to work on here. The amount of growth that said, actually we've just been gradually reducing our bottle weight over the last 10 years, no one's actually noticed. <laughs> I got a case of uh, a Sicilian red from the wine society last week. In fact, we definitely had no um, capsule on. And so it's that gradual sort of just nudging things along. And as you say, just doing the right things, so the consumers kind of gradually end up with a more sustainable product because that's just what's happened. And I think they're more, they'll be more open to that, maybe yeah. in terms of in terms of Prosecco, actually, than in some other areas of wine. Because it doesn't feel so heavy to be left to. Well, yeah, and I think well, what Patricia was saying about kind of kudos, there's a bit less of that around Prosecco. It's not the not got that kind of issue that some other areas of, mm. of wine making have. Yeah, I think actually just it feels, sorry, I didn't want to come into that. Sorry, sorry. Just a very clear observation from, from the slides earlier that it was 6.5% of Prosecco production is organic. Mm. Um, and that in Italy, about 15% is vineyards or, or organically grown. So, you know, I think there's a job to do in sparkling wine areas. It might be cooler, um, there might be some, you know, there might be some kind of reasons for it might not be more disease prone but to sort of help and push towards a higher percentage of organic production you know is in that sustainability sort of you know I would, slightly, I would slightly caution on organic because if you're in a situation where you don't have to do this work because that's the way the bottle works it's brilliant the organic all the time you know this last season more though because it was very wet they had the, the organic uh, producers had to spray 28 times, whereas conventional ones spray four times. So what does that do in terms of carbon footprint? What does that do in terms of soil compaction? You know, it's 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 got to be very much more sort of course sustainability is where you want to get to. For some people, organic or biodynamic can be that route and fabulous. But for others, which is what we're doing with our inputs in our, our regen paper, for other people it can need to be a different a different route to that market. Uh, so it's only one of those yeah, things, but you know, possibly, you know. Making, looking to exploit as many opportunities as exactly. exactly. when you can. Exactly. I think it's not exactly. I agree with that. I think, I think this is one of the things we wanted to go. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Because there, there's a lot of stuff, as you saw today, actually, in comparison to what we showed last year, but we're not. There are more things. I'd have to say it's more cautionary. Just more from our perspective, we brought up the simpler questions. Yeah, right. no, just an observation, actually. Champagne Fermont, I think um, they just launched um, um, the organic brew, uh, uh, brew de la terre and in an 800 gram bottle mm -hmm. uh, which i think just is what it's in good time yeah, that's right this coming in yeah there is and i think there's actually behind the scenes because andrea sent me some other information one of the things he said is what producers are looking at is perhaps not like the bottle really so there is that going on but i think what we did with the first slide was actually just say look at this the social environment community mm -hmm. all of that and it's more coordinated. And actually, the communication is going out to our members as well, coming from Andrea. But it is much, we're doing a lot more of that. And that sounds very easy to say, I know, but I've been in the UK in 2015. So I've seen the developments, I've seen the developments of style, and I've seen actually what we've done in terms of 
more sustainable pieces coming in, but there's a lot of things going on. You saw the Valero project, you saw what was doing that. And I don't think some people even think of doing that. I think there is a generic thing about, look, the separate front, we don't want front home front. But there's also the element of where we, we ought to say, actually, behind the front, we enjoy the white, we are doing this stuff. And that, that's what's good in terms of those projects and doing where in terms of irrigation, where we're doing the varieties, because we're looking, we've got to make a global change of contrast of interest. Can I say something? Yeah. Just towards that. It's a long path. Yeah. Without that study, they, they probably couldn't have done that study themselves. You yeah. wouldn't have any way to do that study. Yeah. Yeah. We're trying to give more and more tools to, to improve uh, all we know. I'm referring to the why uh, only sparkling wine is not in a can. The question that I asked. Well, the, the reason is that European regulation only permits to, for sparkling wine to be in bottles, also because they have to keep the pressure. But it's good about the zonal piece. I'm going to take one more question and then because I appreciate your patience because we were sort of delayed. Yes, yeah, this isn't a question just for anybody to answer who are sort of you know, strongly enough to answer this. This is a second sustainability summit. Yes. So if you come back next year, what would you is there one thing that you'd like to see a sustainable progress within one of our did you hear all that question, everybody? So Emily yeah. just asked about the one thing. We can use that as a summary, because I said to all of you, come up with one thing. Come up with a summary. I'll use that as a usual question, OK? Liver. <laughs> Not what we think at all. OK, well, no, come on. But it's just um, take to, to I this point. What I would like to see is like more, and I would say as a communicator, I want to say as a I think if there is a lack of people understanding what it is, it's going to be the big thing to communicate this to go out there and say this is what it is. Not in a boring way, you know, I think no, it can be fun. I think you can, and the practice is actually happening. So I would, I think it would be nice to see more people out there talking about it. Like, okay, this person does this because of that. There is a reason. There is a reason behind that. You don't look crazy. Thank you, Lima. Right, we're going to do this pretty snappily, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, let's bring it on. Not, not my favorite one, actually, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Ellen. Um, yeah, similar to, similar to what Lima said, really, the, sto the story time, I think, something to be clearer, um, fun. Um, I, I mean, also, this kind of idea that, you know, you can't kind of wait for consumers to take the lead, you know, with this, this combination of pushing them in the right direction, which does, I think, at the latest one, but it comes from the industry pushing them in the right direction, it's kind of a carrot and stick thing. So I think for me it would be seeing, yeah, a combination of that, kind of like showing them why it's important, but also recognising the reality of the situation and just thinking that, you know, progress is, progress is good, it's just going to be a long road. Shane, like how, wants to plant the blocks now. There we go. Don't mind coming back about adoption of standards. Probably be just, um, but we need to see some standards. And I think if we don't have those standards, then consumers are going to be looking for different things. And that's going to be hard for the industry. And I go back to my analogy before about the whole you know, now, and that's just wacky. It came from nowhere. We knew this was there, consumers were talking about it, and suddenly it was mandated. And that's both a real you know, challenge for the industry and a great opportunity. Because at the moment, consumers want these things, but won't pay for them. The moment they're willing to pay for them, the government says the industry has to pay for them. Ah. 
So maybe not next year, but probably in the 13th sustainable period. <laughs> we'll be looking back and thinking, why, why, will we dis you know, why will we be discussing, you know, why were only eight people you know, interested in spending a bit more on something sustainable? You know, but we do need to, we need to get there, we need to have um, a, a real vision there. I'm very optimistic because you know, my friend's kids are drinking wine, fortunately, they're still drinking wine, but um, you know, they, they are, they don't know what a conventional wine is anymore because they're drinking so much natural wine. Might not be my choice, but you know, that, you know, that they are exposed to different types of wine. We are sort of exposed, or we're very used to being exposed to sort of conventionally you know, made wines, and that is going to change. So, you know, we need to make it change. So definitely we're in the, in the push factor. Um, and also, I've got this wine from, from Bruce of Paradin out there, and you know, he, he was saying about all the work he's gone through in sustainability, and it's ended up with, has anyone seen this? No, yeah. this type, I've got this vegan thing, but an absolutely minuscule thing yeah. that you know, proclaims the sustainability. So we have to mm. shout about it more, have some way of you know, taking a QR code and then saying, mm. you know, but, but, um, you know, sustainability is at the heart of what we do. Mm. Mm. Um, and that, that could be as much as you say, you know, mm. you hear the reasons why, but then let's talk about the fun product that we make. Thank you very much, Tom. So, Peter, I don't agree with what you made. It's, it's about clarity. I and mean, we've said it's, sustainability is incredibly complicated. Consumers, all of us, sort of find it completely brain numbing to work out what we should be doing. We as the industry need to be clear about what do we need to be doing putting in that direction. There's a bottle we can call, we've done that in terms of distilled bottles. You know, buy a bottle, that's lighter, preferably they've got four of them running around, that's environmentally a good thing, tick in box. You know, we're, going, we're doing the work on sustainability standards, making sure that it's clear how standard A can play with standard B. So again, the consumer can be told, it doesn't really matter what the way it happens today, all of those, what those wines are fine. You know, packaging, let's look at um, how we, we look at other packaging. You know, how do you stack up different packaging perhaps against each other? So again, you're making the decision for everyone along the supply chain who doesn't have sustainability in their job title. You're making it easy to see what the choices they need to be taking that is going in the direction of sustainability. And lastly, on the input to the regen. The question of, you know, you've launched a bottle of course, we're going to launch the regen, the sustainable viticulture protocol. And again, that will be clear, right? Growers who signed up for that, they are using the sort of techniques we've been talking about. Um, in a joined up coherent way. So again, it's making a very complex topic into something where you've got the evidence base to say, right, this is the better direction to go. If you don't need, if you want to understand the details, great, but you don't need to, you've done it. Okay. Thank you very much, Peter. Can I just uh, say, I would just like to say thank you to all of you. You can all give yourselves a round of applause if you like, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, just behind Joe here, Emily. I want to give Emily Davis a round of applause because Emily is all awesome. <laughs> And I'd also like to thank very much Flavia Della Nora coming over from our Prosecco Garden School. We've been doing a lot of stuff, and a lot of things are happening, and we're driving it forward. And what I want to do is thank this wonderful panel because they put in loads of effort, loads of time and give us a lot of fantastic content, and really engaging content. It was fun, it was engaging, but it was a heck of a load of great stuff in there. And I really appreciate them spending all the time doing that. And you know, we keep going, and going, and saying, hey, do you want to do this? And come on, let's do it. And I think that's been really positive. So go with them, they can come back with a 13th Prosecco Dogs fucking <laughs> so it's okay, they'll be here. And we will be picking up on that question over here, okay? Uh, but also it's given us a great, opportunities for Seco Doc to present to you as well. We really appreciate that. So thanks very much indeed. Give a big round of applause for the panel. We're going to turn around and can you do a photo? Actually, we'll, let's all stand up everybody and we'll do a photo. We haven't got a glass. No, we need glasses. We need glass. Can we do a quick glass shot? Oh yeah, just take right, okay. Just oh, go right, like so. <laughs> right, there we go. <laughs> and I should have said, thank you very much for the glass of bubbly, Chris Morgan, all the people.